Hello, and welcome to the League of Women Voters of Portland Candidate Forum for the Metro Councilor Seats. My name is Linda Mather, and I will be the forum moderator. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization dedicated to making democracy work. We believe democracy works best when voters are informed about issues and engaged in their communities. We're presenting this forum to give voters the opportunity to learn more about these particular two candidates, Mary Nolan and Chris Smith. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we cannot hold in-person candidate events. I'm joining you from Metro East Community Media Studios, while our candidates are participating from their own locations. We're grateful for support from the Carol and Velma Sailing Foundation, the League of Women Voters of Portland Education Fund, the Weiss Foundation, the Sarah Fewing Fund, and our media partner, Metro East Community Media. In terms of guidelines, let me just quickly say that there are mainly time guidelines. So both of the candidates will give us a two minute opening and they'll have 90 seconds to answer the questions. Then there'll be a two minute closing. We have lots of issues to cover. So Mary and Chris, please, I ask you to adhere to the allotted time. Okay. As determined by coin toss, Mary will give the first opening statement and then we'll continue to answer questions and alternate throughout. So Mary, if you'd like to get us started with your opening, please. Yes, thank you, Linda. And thanks to the League and Metro East for hosting this event. I am a League member and I have supported the goals of voter education and voter participation oh, for longer than we wanna talk about. I'm Mary Nolan. And I'm here as a candidate for Metro Council District 5. The hopes and dreams of Portlanders have stayed steady throughout the last year, even as life around us has changed. Portlanders still want comfortable, affordable, safe homes in a welcoming community with meaningful work um, that can support a family and achieve prosperity. They want good schools and equitable opportunities. They are committed to stewardship and enjoyment of our natural resources. But as we all know, conditions have changed dramatically, especially in the short term. Quarantines and distancing, temporary job losses that were deeply affecting Oregonians and Portlanders, some permanent job losses and certainly some broad permanent changes in work settings. An increased awareness of, and yet some tension around, climate disaster. I don't think there are any magic wands. Instead, I believe a lot of clear-eyed work lies ahead for Metro and its new council. And it's that clear-eyed capacity to focus and offer a steady hand that I would bring to the Metro Council. The Oregonian endorsed me saying, she would inject scrutiny and broaden the public benefit of Metro's operations. Her span of uh, benefit would span all of Metro's portfolio. And the Portland Tribune endorsed me saying, her critical thinking and experience as a legislator and public agency manager would be particularly helpful to regional government now. I look forward to the conversation today and I look forward to earning your vote in the next few weeks. Thank you. Thank you Mary. And Chris, your opening statement, please. Uh, thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this event, continuing to inform voters even as we all learn how to deal with the pandemic. I followed a job to this region in 1988 Instead of staying for a few years as planned, I fell in love with this place, found a partner and a home, and helped raise two stepkids. I've enjoyed a 30 plus year career in our region's tech sector. For the last 25 years, I've had a second career as a volunteer citizen activist, leading on neighborhood issues, campaign finance reform, sustainability, transportation, and with an increasingly urgent focus, climate change. That activism has put me on bodies like the Metro Policy Advisory Committee and the Portland Planning and Sustainability Commission, 
where, among other achievements, I've helped preserve 800 acres of habitat on West Hayden Island and block a propane terminal on the Columbia. One of the reasons that climate change, despite being an evident threat, is so hard to address is that there are powerful economic forces aligned to preserve the status quo. That's why my campaign is rejecting big money. Indeed, I'm not taking any contributions over $500. My campaign is powered by more than 500 individual donors. Of course, climate change is not our only serious issue. We're also facing up to crises of housing and racism. Our solutions must be intersectional, creating broad prosperity as we transition our economy to a sustainable basis. That's why I'm a supporter of a Green New Deal for our region, our country, and our planet. I look forward to, the discuss to today's discussion. Thank you. And thank you. And Chris, stay with us because we're going to go for the first question. Um, and it's one of those great 90-second questions. <laughs> um, so uh, of all the critical issues that are facing Metro, uh, pick one or two, and how would you address them? Well, uh, climate change is my main focus, uh, and an issue front and center at Metro today is uh, how we make our transportation system more sustainable. Uh, we have a bond measure, or, or sorry, a transportation measure on the ballot that will include both bonding for projects as well as programs. Uh, I'm supportive of that measure because it will give people choices besides drive alone auto trips. Uh, importantly, it funds Youth Pass, uh, a program I've been a big supporter of that will let all our high school age youth use transit for free. Uh, and ultimately it creates opportunities for transit to get around traffic congestion. Uh, so that as we deploy more transit in the future, which is a big part of my campaign as well, in increasing both the frequency and number of routes on our transit system, uh, the buses won't get stuck in traffic congestion. Thank you. Thank you. And Mary, how about you for the critical issues facing Metro right now? It is a good 90 second question. <laughs> um, well, I agree with Chris that transportation is an important issue. Um, we know that even if the measure passes, the funds won't be available until 2022. And I would focus in the first year of my term on the pressing immediate right in front of us now issues. I think there are two, one that is substantive and one that is um, overarching. The substantive one is the ha homeless crisis and the affordable housing crisis. Metro has been given two tools by the voters to address those issues in the form of an affordable housing bond measure and a levy to provide supportive services to help move homeless people off the street and into safe shelter and, and eventually into affordable housing. That will be my first focus in the Metro um, Council. The overarching issue is coming together as a region and finding solutions that can work for the whole region. That means helping sh make sure that every jurisdiction, every county, every city, and the whole region step up and do their part for solutions around rebuilding our economy, supporting good educational outcomes, and supporting uh, safe and affordable housing. So it's that bringing together the convening that I'm really good at, and that'll be my focus. Hey, thank you. And Mary, stay with us too. Okay. With these issues, however, we know there's budget stuff. So if cuts are required in the budget as a result of the pandemic or otherwise, describe the process you would use to dis figure out where to cut. Linda, I'm particularly pleased with the way you phrased that because I do think it is a process. Budgets of any kind, but particularly public agency budgets like Metro, the state, um, the city, and the county, are a reflection and a tool for expressing and achieving our values. And that's the way I have approached budgeting when I ran major agencies for the city of Portland, the Public Works Agency, the Bureau of Environmental Services, prioritizing things that really speak to values. Equally, when I was the co-chair of Ways and Means in the legislature, balancing the budget for 168 different state agencies with a budget, a general fund budget of close to $30 billion of biennium. At Metro, I would make sure we have clear discussion 
that engages the entire council and is transparent with the public, including inviting public participation to set our values, to set the things that we really want to achieve and the things we want to avoid cutting. Um, cuts are difficult. I've had to do them. They are painful. They are the hardest part of the job. But I also am committed to accountability and transparency to voters. And I will make those decisions in collaboration with my colleagues in front of the public. Chris, how about you for the question? It's how are you going to handle cuts? Thank you. I think it's important to recognize first that uh, the way Metro is structured uh, with a number of different responsibilities, uh, there are multiple budgets uh, and some of them are walled off from each other. So for example, uh, we can't take dollars that the voters gave us for natural areas acquisitions and use that to plug holes in the general fund. That's not allowed. Uh, the most dire budget situation is in the venues. Uh, uh, the zoo to some degree, but particularly the convention center, expo center, and performing arts center. Uh, and again, those have their own segregated budget, uh, but frankly, deep cuts are gonna to continue to be necessary there to keep those facilities uh, in a ready to open status uh, for the point when eventually audiences will come back. Um, in fact, it may be necessary for Metro's general fund to subsidize those to some degree. Uh, and that's probably gonna be the difficult conversation. Uh, you know, like Mary, I believe we need to do this uh, in full view of the public. Uh, I also think we need to take uh, a, a long-term view to that. So the, the way Metro's budgets work, um, the, the various funds tend to have multi-year periods in which the changes cascade through. Uh, so I think it's important uh, to, as Metro's staff has started to do, to rebalance the budget on a five-year basis, uh, look at what that's gonna mean for the general fund functions, uh, which are the core planning functions that are so essential to Metro, and make the hard choices there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, both of you have alluded a little bit to uh, communicating with the public. And I think we are all in situations where it's Metro what? Metro who? Exactly. So, uh, Chris, how would you increase the public's understanding of Metro and what they do and its function? Uh, well, one of the things that I would do that, uh, frankly, I was a little surprised to see wasn't standard practice is uh, serving on the Planning Commission in Portland, uh, all of our meetings uh, are televised and available on YouTube. Um, that has not been true of Metro uh, in the past. It's a little bit different now that we're, we're in pandemic times and all the meetings are happening on Zoom. Uh, the, those uh, Zoom sessions are more readily available, but I would make a standard practice of televising not just Metro Council uh, formal meetings, but also the work sessions, which is where a lot of uh, important uh, data is revealed and uh, the, the preliminary decision-making happens. Um, I've also used different outreach tools uh, in different roles that I've had. Uh, as a planning commissioner, for example, at times I have blogged about issues in front of us to invite the public to comment through that more informal channel. Um, I think it's also important we're learning through the pandemic uh, that Zoom can be a good way for people to to communicate with us in hearings. Uh, they don't have to leave their homes and they can participate fully. So I suspect when the pandemic's over, we'd like to go back to some kind of hybrid role where people may choose to show up in the audience to testify or may choose to connect electronically to testify and we should preserve those options. Thanks. And thank you, Mary, how about you? Thanks, um, I think it's an important question. I do think the world uh, has learned how to do things differently in, in the last few months. And I think we ought to take advantage of that on a, per, on a permanent basis. Um, but there are some things that are tried and true um, and engage uh, interested people and educate them. Um, as a, an elected official, as a state legislator, I routinely had town hall meetings at different places around the district that I represent. I think I will continue that practice as a Metro counselor. It's a fairly large geography it stretches from Park Rose out to uh, St. John's and Linton and out into Cedar Mill and includes downtown. I'd make myself available as an individual to hear people's concerns so that I can raise them as their representative on the council. As a co-chair of Ways and Means at the legislature, I also established a practice that is continuing to this day where the legislature takes really important discussions 
out to the, the voters themselves, out to the residents of all across Oregon. Now, Oregon's a lot bigger than the metro area, but I think it's a practice that was established and conducted well during the development of the transportation package with meetings all over the district. And I would like to see that made permanent. Okay, thank you. Both of you have alluded to um, collaboration with the various regional districts and towns, et cetera, the jurisdictions. Could you speak a little bit more about how you would do that? How would you plan to work with the jurisdictions? Mary, start us, please. There are a couple of different layers to this. One is the jurisdictions. But I think before that, I would start with the individuals because Metro covers a territory with three, three counties. I can't remember exactly how many cities, lots of special districts in the area. Um, and I believe that the most effective work, the best collaboration in finding common solutions is done through um, trust relationships among the principals. And I would spend time, as I have throughout my career, further developing the relationships I already have with mayors around the region, with county chairs, with county commissioners, and get to understand their perception of what is important for their constituents. Because by understanding each other's priorities, by understanding each other's values, we can find common ground much more readily. Then there's the formal side of it because you do have jurisdictions. And Metro's authority has some limits. Um, Metro doesn't set zoning, um, local zoning re requirements, but can incentivize it both through grants that it makes and through intergovernmental agreements in order to achieve the goals that Metro collectively has for the region. Thank you, and Chris? How would you ha work with the uh, jurisdictions? Thank you. Uh, Metro actually has a formal mechanism for that. It's called the Metro Policy Advisory Committee. Uh, and it's composed of mayors and county commissioners and city councilors from the various uh, jurisdictions around the metro area, uh, as well as three metro councilors. And that's where policy ideas get vetted before they go to the metro council. So you have a, a built-in legislative mechanism to make sure that you have uh, an opportunity to build consensus. I had the honor of serving on that body for several years as the citizen representative for Multnomah County. Uh, and in doing so, I made an effort to forge relationships across the region. For example, I you know, got on the number 57 bus and went all the way out to Forest Grove to meet with the mayor there, who is a member of uh, MPAC. Uh, since I was representing Multnomah County, I made a point of uh, meeting with uh, members from uh, East County, Gresham and East, other East County cities uh, so that I had a, a full range of the issues there. Uh, and in fact, if you look at my endorsements page on my website, ChristopherMetro.com, you'll see that many of those city councilors, mayors, and county commissioners uh, are in fact endorsing my campaign. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get to some specifics for um, Metro. And Chris, you'll start us with how can Metro best address the continuing issue of housing affordability? So there, there are two sets of tools uh, that Metro has been given by the voters to work on that. The first is an affordable housing bond measure that was adopted by the voters uh, in 2018. I was proud to have been a member of the Speakers Bureau for the campaign for that measure, and that provides a little over $600 million to help construct affordable housing around the region. Uh, part of the challenge there is that uh, we do not have inexpensive options to build uh, that kind of affordable housing. Units typically cost $300,000 and up. Uh, one of the things I'd like to do is look for more innovative uh, approaches to spend that money. Uh, for example, I've talked to one, one party who has an idea for converting motels uh, and believe that we can uh, take old motels, refurbish them, and have uh, affordable units for uh, around $150,000. Uh, the second tool is the housing services measure that was adopted just uh, this May. And again, I campaigned for it even when I was campaigning in my primary. Beginning in the middle of next year, that will provide us with funding for services to help people uh, get off the street where we can meet their needs, whether it's uh, substance abuse counseling or uh, help with mental health issues. Uh, those funds will give us the ability to meet people where they are and try and get them back into stable housing. 
Thank you. Thank you. And Mary, housing? Thanks. I think there are three areas. Chris pointed out two of them. I would beg to differ with him on the first one, and that is construction of affordable housing. The voters did approve a $650 million bond um, for Metro to incentivize uh, construction of affordable housing. But some of the units in that, in the first uh, projects that have been approved, are closing in on $400,000 a unit. I don't think we have to wait for a new idea. Reconverting hotels might be viable, but there are developers now building unsubsidized worker, you know, working family housing that it costs $170,000 to $180,000 a unit without any subsidy, including without subsidy for the rents. We can do this. I would bring the energy to bring those models forward, discuss them with the cities and the counties around the region, and find ways to encourage them to change their codes so that we can um, expand that around the region. If we bring the price of a housing unit down from $400,000 to $200,000, we can build twice as many. That's twice as many families. I think on the services measure, we need to expedite the receipt of that. We can issue tax anticipation notes and deal with that as the crisis we claimed it was in the campaign. Thank you. And Mary, start us with this one. All right. Land, but a little bit different. How, if at all, would you favor adjusting Metro's current policies concerning the designation and use of property as industrial lands? I think this is really a process question. Um, Metro will have the opportunity to deal with urban growth, um, the urban growth boundary and uh, urban reserves and rural reserves during the term of whoever wins this election. Um, and the process needs to be inclusive. Oregon has enviable laws that Metro's governed by that, that set a, a, a priority for land conservation and development. We espouse development within well-served, with infrastructure and efficient industrial land, commercial land, recreational land, habitat as both a, a recreational value and also as a climate change, climate preserving asset. And I'd approach this with a, a process that includes, just as we discussed earlier, open conversations, transparent discussions in front of the public, um, involving all the communities that are interested and have a stake in this, um, making sure that the process is deep and not just superficial finding ways to allow people to have more than just two minutes or three minutes in a public hearing, but actually grapple together with the tensions around this issue. Thank you. And Chris, industrial lands? Well, this is a very live issue uh, directly in front of the Portland Planning and Sustainability Commission at the moment. Uh, we've been asked by the community to find ways to prioritize uh, preservation of trees and, and planting of new trees as an important tool to deal with climate change. Uh, trees are one of the most valuable tools to prevent the so-called urban heat island effect, where if you have vast areas of concrete and asphalt, uh, they're very, very hot compared to surrounding areas. And surprise, surprise, it's the lower income uh, and neighborhoods of people of color that tend to have the least trees. So in looking to change the regulations to alter that, uh, we ran into the fact that um, the, the statewide land use planning goals uh, sort of pit issues against each other. Uh, there's a requirement to have a 20 year supply of industrial land. Uh, we're told if we put trees on a big chunk of that industrial land that will fall below having a 20 year supply, we can't do that. Well, uh, as part of the Green New Deal, we need to find a way to accommodate all of those. We need to have the industrial jobs uh, that you know, uh, pay people with a, with a moderate uh, education, uh, good family wage jobs, but we still have to have the trees because the trees are gonna be important to, to being resilient against, against climate change. So I think that the region should probably uh, instigate a conversation with uh, the Land Conservation Development Commission in Salem to talk about how we can have goals that are framed in a way that we can do both rather than constantly pitting those two objectives against each other. Thank you. 
Thank you. And Chris Day for the next question. What is your assessment of Metro's current recycling policies and would you seek to adjust them at all? Uh, yes, I, our recycling efforts are currently back on their heels a bit. Uh, China adopted uh, a significant policy change a couple years ago uh, where they stopped buying uh, recycled bulk from the United States. And we've had to find new markets for paper and plastics uh, that China is no longer taking. Uh, so some things that we were previously able to uh, recycle through foreign markets, uh, we now have to find either new markets or they're actually winding up in the landfill, which is unfortunate. Uh, in addition to trying to develop those new markets and Metro is a partner uh, in state efforts to do that, I think it's also important that we identify other items uh, that are potentially recyclable. For example, there's an effort now to look at mattresses because as it turns out, mattresses have a lot of recyclable content. Uh, so one way to do that would be to create a product stewardship model where the person who sells the mattress is responsible to make sure that it can ultimately be recycled. Uh, that works in other areas, for example, like toner cartridges, um, where you send something back to the manufacturer so it can be either reused or recycled in a responsible way. So there's, there's clearly more work to do. Um, thank you. Uh, Mary, recycling. Thanks, Linda. Um, this is actually right up my alley. Um, when I was Director of Environmental Services for the City of Portland, my team and I launched um, the first curbside recycling program in Portland. Um, and that's a few years ago, I acknowledge. So the, process, the, the outcome we achieved then has not aged as well. I mean, it's done, done its service for 20 some odd years, but as Chris mentioned, the world market for recycled material, for recyclable material has changed dramatically. And that is largely because we now are producing so much more use once throw away packaging um, for takeout food, for packaging of grocery items, even produce gets packaged in grocery stores even before the pandemic. So I think one of the ways we need to change that is to collaborate with the state, with other large regions in the, on the West Coast around how we can upstream responsibility, not just for big items, mattresses have been recycled at the, um, at the uh, shops, at the stores for years, but hold fast food stores accountable for the waste that they produce by inviting them to return it or to pay the cost of disposing of it responsibly. Look at other packaging, work together with DEQ to make sure we're setting policies that are in sync with the state and have that kind of um, force. Thank you. Okay, yeah. let's shift a little bit. We know that the uh, bond measure is there. How's about Mary, uh, it is your turn, yes. Uh, speak a little bit to the bond measure, the uh, ballot measure, excuse me. You're talking about the transportation measure. Yeah. It's, it's, as Chris pointed out earlier, it is not a bond measure. Um, it is a levy um, that would provide funds which could be bonded um, to build capital improvements, but there's an element of that um, package that includes ongoing operating programs that wouldn't be bonded, wouldn't be um, capitalized, but would be annual op, um, services. Most particularly, for example, um, expansion of the youth pass to the region, um, the entire region. Chris and I both support that. Um, he tried um, for a number of years to achieve that, but it took, it took until Metro took this lead for it to actually make, have some movement. Um, I think the measure has some really good aspects. 80 some percent of the revenue will be spent on transit or pedestrian and bicycle improvements, which is really helpful for both mobility and for um, climate preservation. Um, the measure was developed um, in, intentionally through a lens of equity and involved leaders from communities of color from around the region in genuine conversation about priorities. And those two things make it really valuable. Um, I've got some complaints about the measure, um, but in, on the whole, I think it's a worthy measure for the voters to support. Thank you. And Chris, your position on the ballot. 
Uh, like Mary, I believe that this uh, measure does a great deal for equity in our region, uh, investing resources uh, in communities that have traditionally been underserved. Uh, there are also big safety improvements uh, that are part of this measure. Uh, it will construct uh, hundreds of miles of sidewalks in places where they have been missing. Uh, the, uh, the area perhaps where I've had struggled the most with this is in climate. Uh, the measure itself is carbon neutral with just a set of projects uh, that it builds. Uh, but I believe that when coupled with a regional demand management strategy, something like congestion pricing, uh, the fact that we're improving bicycling, walking, transit access uh, will mean that people have other choices besides driving alone. And that's a reason that I'm a big supporter of this measure. As Mary says, uh, Youth Pass is something that we've expanded gradually over time. It started out just in Portland Public Schools. We were able to expand it to other uh, school districts within the city of Portland. Uh, and now with this measure, we can take it regional. And that's a great achievement. Thank you. Thank you. We've been talking about the issues. Chris, uh, let me shift a little bit and say, what particular skill do you bring to this position of Metro Counselor? Uh, well, I think the way my friends would say it is that I'm a policy wonk. Uh, I get into the details uh, and I can connect the details to the high level policy and goals. Uh, I've developed policy analysis skills over 25 years as a citizen activist, uh, working at everything from neighborhood policy to uh, campaign finance, uh, with probably my biggest concentration being in transportation. Uh, but then in the last uh, 11 years, I've been serving on the Portland Planning and Sustainability Commission. Uh, so I've gotten an entire education uh, in land use policy. And I think a part of the evolution across that time has been a shifting focus on equity and racial justice. I and mean, we, we spent the last 10 years on the Portland Planning and Sustainability Commission, recentering all our policies on equity uh, and learned in fact, that that's not enough. We have to actually be uh, actively anti-racist in our policies. We're, we're beginning to, uh, to learn how to do that, incorporate that in our policies. And that's a direction I'd like to continue in Metro. Thanks. Thank you. And Mary, your particular skills for this position. Chris and I seem to think, um, see the job differently. I see this job as a representative and a convener to establish regional cooperation, regional collaboration in solving very big problems collectively. That is my resume. I have a reputation as a collaborator, as someone who creates an environment in which people comfortably and effectively share their perspectives, share their values, identify their priorities, identify their must-haves, and work together to come up with a solution. It's the nature of work in the legislature where I served for 12 years, chairing numerous committees, co-chairing committees with Republicans, and still finding a way to craft really important legislative fixes and solutions for all of Oregon. It's what I've done as a business owner in bringing together competitors. I served on a, a national committee for NASA, bringing together direct competitive interests and resolving issues around new standards that are appropriate to an electronic age. And it's what I've done as a nonprofit executive, finding ways to incentivize behavior um, in a positive way and negotiate um, difficult uh, agreements that reflect and succeed around community values. Okay, Mary, uh, we're gonna start on this one. Unfortunately, this goes probably nationally, but let's see what we can do about it locally. Many surveys and reports have documented declining trust in the democratic institutions in our country. Do you agree? And if so, what would, you, what would your approach be to rebuilding trust in our institutions? Another one of those nice 90 second ones. Um, I agree. And I don't think it has been happenstance. I think it has been deliberate. Um, and I think it has been deliberate on the part of many, uh, particularly right wing organizations and so, so called think tanks at the national level, starting back with Ronald Reagan, um, basically thought 
the role of elected officials was to shrink government. We have not suffered that as much in Oregon and the Portland region, but there are some cracks around the edges that are worth, um, worth considering. I think the best way to address it is absolute transparency. Um, and I am comfortable with that. I do it um, respectfully um, in a way that leaves doors open. I can uh, disagree with colleagues um, directly and in some cases very severely without fracturing the ability to work with them on issues that we share in common. And that's modeling that behavior, showing my colleagues and partners around the region that that's the way I work and that I am trustworthy. Um, I have to earn their trust, but demonstrating that is the best thing I as an individual counselor can do and as a role model around the community. Thank you. And Chris, rebuilding trust? I agree that it's a nat national problem. Uh, that has in large part been uh, caused by the extreme partisanship. It seems like we just get more and more tribal every election cycle, uh, and that's regrettable. Um, one of the causes that I, I believe is at the root of that is the way we fund our elections and the, the huge contributions that have become de rigueur for how we, uh, how we pay for our campaigns. Uh, I'm personally rejecting that model by limiting contributions in my campaign to $500. Um, but I think Metro is somewhat fortunate that we haven't seen that kind of polarization in Metro issues. And I think Metro has had uh, the opportunity to build trust with the community over time. And I can't think of a better area for that uh, than the natural area bond measures. Voters have uh, on multiple occasions now uh, given Metro hundreds of millions of dollars to acquire natural areas both inside and outside the urban growth boundary to preserve some of those as habitat, to make others available for recreation. Uh, I think that kind of long-term uh, trust, uh, trust building and delivery uh, against promises is an important way to circumvent the polarization we see today. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And Chris, we'll start with you on this one. Um, I need to prep you both because it really isn't a question. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, I found this on the website, and I just was intrigued by it, and I thought it might be um, a different way to come at why you were intrigued with this role. So, Metro works with communities, businesses, and residents in the Portland metropolitan area to chart a wise course for the future while protecting the things we love about this place. What do you love about this place? You know, it's interesting. Uh, when I graduated from college, uh, I had uh, job opportunities in, uh, in two places, in the Boston area uh, and in, uh, in Texas. And uh, I look at those places and, uh, you know, having grown up in New England might be uh, a bias, but uh, Boston seemed like a much uh, more livable urban region uh, than, than several Texas cities. Um, when I was faced with a relocation choice later in my career, uh, I again looked around the country uh, and indeed around the globe at the cities I had visited and where I would want to live and Portland rose to the top. Uh, and I think it's uh, both a combination of our natural uh, topography, the fact that you have uh, you know, an, an urban area and a verdant valley with easy access to the coast, to the mountains, to the high desert, uh, but also an ethic here uh, that is about tolerance of different ideas and different lifestyles uh, and a deep respect for uh, the natural environment in which we sit. And uh, that's the reason I stayed here for 30 plus years uh, and why I'd like to be on the council to help uh, keep those things uh, to be real, even as we face you know, a disaster set of consequences from climate change potentially if we don't get this right. Thanks. Thank you, and Mary? What do I love about this region? It's a pretty easy answer, the people. The people in their diversity, in their striving, in their art, in their music, in their support for each other, in their insisting on improving their community, owning their community, and carving a destiny 
for themselves, for their family, for their neighbors. Um, I am just in love with the Portland area people. Um, this place has been defined by its people for centuries, since before Lewis and Clark arrived here, when this area was inhabited by Chinookan people and creating a sense of community and with that community, uh, a partnership in stewarding the land. Um, we've grown since then. We are becoming a more diverse and equitable community. We're not there yet, but we are striving. We are striving together. We are acknowledging our shortcomings. We are acknowledging our past mistakes, our past blunders, um, and we are addressing it together as a community, as a unit. Um, and I love being part of that, and I want to help make sure that those voices all participate in shaping the way this region develops. Okay, thank you. And thank you, both candidates. You can breathe a little bit. We're going to move now to your closing statements. And Mary, you go first. Okay, thanks. As I mentioned at the beginning, I am a lifelong League member. My mother gave me my first membership as a graduation gift from college. I was raised in the ethos of consensus, concurrence, and collaboration. I was skilled, schooled in those skills, not just by lead unit meetings and board service, but by leaders like Governor Brown and Governor Roberts, like Senator Wyden, Speaker Tina Kotek, State Senators Margaret Carter and Lou Frederick, County Commissioner Sushila Jayapal, all of whom have endorsed me for this position. They've endorsed me because of my reputation, my really honed and practiced skills at convening, at setting a table that's inclusive, at acknowledging the challenges in front of us, and in respecting and acknowledging the, the needs, the backgrounds, the lived experiences of everyone who calls Portland their home. As the scanner said when it endorsed me, I know the issues. I am a really hard worker. And that's hard, hard worker, not just in the sense of studying the data, but in studying the people and studying the needs that they have. And the scanner concluded that I'm the clear choice for this district that represents a large portion of our African-American population in this region. I'm Mary Nolan. I'm known as an effective, bold and inclusive champion for livability and equity. I'm asking for your vote so that I can bring that commitment to the Metro Council next year. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Chris, your closing statement, please. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about District 5. District 5 is a fossil fuel sacrifice zone. From the levees on the Columbia, which the Army Corps of Engineers is now evaluating because they will be under more pressure from the intense rainfalls that climate change will bring, to the five freeways that border and bisect the district, creating significant air quality issues. From the oil trains traveling through the district to the central energy hub at Linton, a time bomb waiting to literally explode during an earthquake, the district is at risk due to fossil fuels. And let's not forget the auto scrapyards in the Cully neighborhood and the mountain of tires that burned a few years ago, forcing the evacuation of low income neighbors. The people of District 5 haven't had to pay the kind of price for climate change that Talent and Phoenix did just recently. But the risk is there, as we all experience with the wildfire smoke. And we pay a price in the form of diesel particulates and air toxins most days of every year. District 5 is this way because powerful interests have encouraged continued inaction. That's why you see ODOT continuing to widen freeways and Zenith trying to expand their oil terminal. We've all read Rob Davis's Polluted by Money series. 
it's evident that we can't keep unlimited campaign contributions and expect meaningful action on climate or racial justice. That's why, unlike my opponent, I've never taken fossil fuel money or contributions from other extractive industries or the Portland Police Union. I'm an independent community member who has received support from over 500 community members. That's why this baby boomer has been endorsed by Sunrise, the youth climate movement. They know that I have a demonstrated record of successfully fighting for carbon reduction in a sustainable urban environment. I'm also endorsed by the Oregon League of Conservation Voters, Willamette Week, the Portland Mercury. So you can see my full list of endorsers and learn about my campaign at ChristopherMetro.com. I've spent 20 years preparing for this role and I ask for your vote in this election. Thank you. Thank you. And a little side note, thank you both. You timed that to two minutes. <laughs> that was good practice. You warned us ahead of time. <laughs> We're both good at following instructions. Eh, maybe I'm not so good at following instructions, but this one I did. Well, I used to teach. I'm really impressed by my students here. Thank you, thank you. Anyway, and I want to thank you as candidates for your knowledge and commitment, which are very clear for the audience. And audience, please share this forum recording with your family and your friends. We all need to be informed voters. This recording and other information about these candidates will be on the vote411.org website through election day. That's vote411.org. You should receive your ballot around October 14th. As with all Oregon elections, it is mail-in only. Ballots are due by 8 p.m. on Tuesday, November 3rd. Postmarks do not count, so therefore mail them by October 27th to ensure that they're received. Or find a drop-off location near you, and again, you can do that by going to vote411.org or in your voter pamphlet. This is Linda Mather for the League of Women Voters of Portland. Thank you for watching. Please be an informed voter. I know you're interested because you're here watching, but please help others, your friends, your families, your neighbors, everyone to be able to vote. Your vote, everyone's vote counts. Thank you. <laughs>